Good morning. When we're um, assembled on Sundays, it's uh, at least it was common at one point um, to hear people say uh, that we are together for the Sabbath. Um, but I think in modern uh, church assemblies, it's not that common to hear people refer to Sunday as the Sabbath uh, because we have a pretty good understanding um, that the Sabbath arrest of Saturday and the Sunday morning assembly, uh, as outlined in the New Testament, are separate things. One thing to look at, though, is the role that uh, especially the sim symbolism of the Sabbath has and what effect uh, that has on our understanding of God. In other words, our theology. What is it that we are talking about when we as Christians try and understand the Sabbath and the rest that God not only has uh, exemplified himself on the seventh day uh, after creation, but also um, has sort of portrayed as being a future for all believers and the thing that we're all trying to attain to. When we go to the writings of the Hebrew writer there in Hebrews and chapter 3, we're going to be reading from someone whose audience um, has a very good understanding of what exactly the Sabbath is, um, being Hebrews, being Jewish Christian believers. They, of course, practice the Sabbath as part of their, uh, their Jewish faith and their understanding of God and their heritage uh, towards uh, respecting his old law in the Old Testament. And they also have uh, this understanding of Christ as their Savior and their continued uh, dedication to him. So let's start by reading in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, and we'll have some more comments to follow there. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those who Moses led out of Egypt, and with whom he was angry for forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who obey, disobeyed? So we see that if they were not able to enter, because they, of their in, unbelief. <clears throat> Therefore, since the promise of entering the, his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we have also had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I, had, I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere it was spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. And it still remains that some will enter the rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God again set a certain day, calling it today. When a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains, then, a Sabbath rest for God's people, if anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and heart attitudes of the heart. Nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom, a him who, to whom we must give an account. You know, it's interesting because most stories, you could probably end with the phrase, and the rest is history. But actually, when we're talking about the rest that God started, uh, it's really literally the beginning. The rest is the... Is from uh, the point from which all of our history and our spiritual uh, understanding of God uh, has to 
come. God made us and rested. And so now all of creation, spiritually and physically, longs uh, for our toil to end and our rest to begin. Now, uh, puns aside, when we're looking at this passage that the Hebrew writer has put forward here, he has a particular goal in mind and something that he wants his uh, audience to understand. He is using their understanding of their cultural and spiritual history in their uh, exodus from Egypt and their coming to the promised land of Canaan to exemplify what it's like to be a Christian. But I think if we're not coming into this with their history in mind and the, the outcome he has, um, he wants to point them at, we might miss some of what he's talking about. Uh, you're used to me being up here in this pulpit and telling you that we need to look at things in context. That's basically the whole uh, sort of uh, theme or thesis or the main focus of my whole uh, ministry. And my goal as a teacher is to get people to think about scripture in the scriptural context and the historical context in which it exists. And this is no exception. You've probably heard verse 12 of this uh, chapter 4 been quoted um, out of context uh, multiple times throughout the time you've been a Christian, if you've been a Christian for any long time at all. It says, again, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. A lot of times when uh, Paul, for example, brings up swords, he'll say the, the armor of God, for example, contains the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, you'll see that both times he talks about the armor of God, and you can go look at those separately. But the Hebrew writer, first of all, is not Paul different person, has a different audience in mind, and in this particular case is using the object and the example of a sword in a totally different way than they would have been using it uh, in Paul's example, and the people would have been thinking about it in Paul's example is what I mean to say. If we look at this double-edged sword in the Hebrew writer's teachings, in the context of the Sabbath rest, what exactly is he saying? Because remember, up to this point, he has been talking about the people who are excluded from the rest that God himself started on the seventh day of creation and then continues on even into eternity. And uh, the thing that we're trying to attain to and the people who are disobedient and not allowed to enter into the rest, just like some people were not allowed to enter into the rest uh, that would be provided by the land of Canaan, the promised land. So what is the, what is the lesson that's being taught about here? Well, what are the qualities of the double-edged sword that he points out here? Uh, well, the first thing it isn't is something that cuts you. In modern English vernacular, because we don't go around carrying swords, we use this phrase wrong. And it's totally wrong if you think about it for more than five seconds. Because if, you, if somebody said that some, a situation has uh, both advantages and disadvantages, right? That something will, has a negative outcome for you as well as a positive outcome. They'll say, well, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand you get this and on the other hand you get that. I'm telling you right now, if you told any soldier in history that he had to carry a sword that would cut him, he would take a stick instead of that sword. He would take any other weapon because you don't go into battle with something that you're going to have to hit yourself with before you hit the other guy. That's just a good way to lose. So don't think of this idiomatically like we think of sword, double-edged swords in modern English. Just put that silly little phrase we have in our vocabulary aside. And think of this as a, as a tool which had an edge on either side, a cutting edge on either side. Now, some of you might have a knife uh, in your kitchen or in your, uh, you know, uh, supplies for cleaning a deer, for example, that at the tip will be sharp on both sides. 
most uh, knives that we have uh, don't go any further than just the, the very end of it having a sharp edge on both sides. Um, and in fact, at least legally in Europe for most of history, that was what um, separated a knife from a sword. Knives had one edge and swords had two. And aside from the tip, which couldn't obviously be blunted entirely, there, was, there wasn't to be any sharpness any further down. Okay, so if we're talking about this here, what is the quality of having uh, both sides be cutting that is useful? Well, if something only cuts on one side, you don't cut by piercing, you cut by slicing, right? You use the long edge of the blade. But if something is double-edged, then you can pierce, you can push through, and that tool will go in and not only will it just stop at the very tip, but you could push it all the way through and separate whatever it is you're trying to cut, whether that's you know, meat or an enemy. <laughs> you can make it into separate pieces um, more efficiently because the tool is designed for the purpose. So the word of God is living and active, not just a double-edged sword, but sharper than any double-edged sword. And it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. So just like a sword might be able to dismember whatever it is we're cutting apart, the, the word of God will divide even down to the two things which are basically the same, soul and spirit. Uh, that he, he can even split apart these things that basically we use interchangeably. Now, I'm not going to get into the theology of what a soul and what a spirit is and what the Bible says about those things. That's a great topic for a later sermon. But the main thing I'd like for us to look at, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the Sabbath rest. So what is it that's being divided out? What is this double-edged sword that the Hebrew writer is pointing at his audience and telling God is cleaving down between your soul and your spirit so that you will be able to understand the difference between those who enter rest and those who don't. This living and active thing that, is, that will uncover and lay bare everything, as it says in verse 13, uh, before the eyes of him who must, to whom we must give an account. Well, it's really about rebellion versus obedience, disobedience versus obedience. The Hebrew writer says that while rest was established on the seventh day, the eternal rest to which we can look forward is only available to those who are continually obedient to God. Otherwise, we get left in the desert like the rest of the disobedient people. We know that even Moses himself in disobeying God, got left in the desert, right? He didn't get to step over the Jordan with Joshua and the rest, but had to die on a mountain looking out, and uh, that's the closest he got, was just he, he sat on top of a mountain and got to look at the prospect of what his people would eventually get to go into. And so there's no exceptions, even for Moses, even for the most important of us, for disobedience, you don't get to enter into rest by being disobedient. And so, as he says at the beginning of chapter 4 here, therefore, since the promise of entering rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So, okay, let's get to this point then. When do you get to rest? We know what laziness looks like. We know what idleness looks like. That's undeserved rest. You take a break before you've ever even started. You decide to put off work that needs to be done till a later time or for somebody else to do. And so when it comes to spiritual work, what is it that we are uh, working on in order to attain to rest, to eventually be able to enter that rest. Well, it is for those who disobey. We see this proved by the negative example that's given in verse 6. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. So some people hear the gospel and disobey, and so they are not able to enter that rest and they're not able to uh, attain to what God has promised them. 
but instead it remains as an outstanding thing, something that we are still looking forward to and still trying to accomplish. So let's actually go back into the history a little bit and look at an example that follows along with this. Joshua, as he brought his people into the land that God had promised them, in Joshua and uh, chapter 1 is where we're going to start, he gives us, uh, uh, we see in this episode here, I think was a perfect example of what it's like for us being Christians on earth right now. Okay, because there are a, a group of men here who get to cross over the Jordan, but they don't get to go home just yet. And I think that's a pretty good example of what, uh, what our relationship with the Sabbath rest of God, with this eternal rest that he's promised us, is like. In he, he, Joshua chapter 1, starting verse 10, we see this. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp. And tell people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land and the the Lord your God is giving to you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. The Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you uh, east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise." Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So I think this is sort of what the Hebrew writer was thinking about when he was talking about this rest. Did you notice what happens with the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh? Joshua specifically says there in verse 13, the Lord your God is giving you rest. But then he tells them, but you don't get to go home just yet. The rest was promised to them and indeed delivered to their families, right? That all of the women and children, anyone who was not fit for fighting got to go home. But the fighting men, all the soldiers, had to cross over Jordan and go with the rest of the tribes um, who ha- didn't have homes yet until every one of them was home, until every one of their cities and towns was secured. And I think that's really uh, a good comparison and maybe even exactly what the Hebrew writer was thinking about when he was talking about Joshua did not give everyone uh, you know, uh, a final rest, uh, because there was still a rest to be attained. These men had to, uh, you know, do the work of securing the salvation of the rest of their people before their own rest could be enjoyed. Because though, that was the only way um, to make sure that all the people were safe and secured. Similarly, uh, it is, we're continuing this story, we'll see something, uh, see this sort of finally play out here in Joshua chapter 22, starting in the first verse there of that chapter, uh, we'll, we'll see the conclusion of what we just read. This promised rest that the, their families had already managed to go and to attain, these men are now going to get um, the results of. Joshua 22, verse 1 says, Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have done all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your brothers, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now that the Lord your God has given your brothers rest as he promised, return to your homes in the land that Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment of the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to obey his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve uh, serve him with all your heart and all of your soul. It's interesting, as we're reflecting on this example, that these men had work to do before they could rest, but the rest 
as he said in chapter one, belonged to them. God gave it to them, but they couldn't utilize it. They couldn't, you know, fuf- they couldn't fulfill that rest. They couldn't enjoy it until after the work was done. But when the time for their rest came, what was it that was waiting on the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh? Well, it was homes already built, their families that they'd been waiting to see for a long time, there waiting on them, a, a home to which they had never been able to go and to uh, rest in, was now there and already fully prepared. If you were looking for a, a home in the future, a rest in, that was far away, and you had a lot of work to do, and you knew that there was family there waiting for you that you hadn't seen for so, so long, you would probably want to do the work well enough so that when you went home, you, your rest was full and complete. You don't want to get called back up into service. You don't want the army to be mustered again. You want to secure that land so that when you go home, you stay home. You get to rest. And it's the same with the gospel here. The, in the spiritual fights that we have to engage in, and in the ways we have to save our, our people from this world of sin, we are looking forward to going to our eternal home in heaven and the heavenly family that is waiting for us there. It's not just about the difference between rebellious and obedient people, but it, it, it's about the ways that the rebellious people get excluded from the thing that universally everybody wants, which is rest and peace at home. We understand that on a deep and a, an emotional human level, but, we'll, but when we're talking about these spiritual things, we can understand that it's even deeper than what we're able to comprehend right now. And the satisfaction that we'll get from that rest is better than anything that we can get here while we're on earth. And so when we're looking at the difference between disobedience and uh, missing the opportunities to fulfill God's commands here on this earth and the great fulfillment of rest that we will eventually attain to in heaven thanks to the great promises brought to us by Jesus, we can see why the work is worth doing. And so we can conclude that the rest is history. Maybe I shouldn't end on a pun, but uh, I, that's the best way I know how to communicate sometimes. So I hope the lesson has been beneficial for you today and one that we can take and apply to our spiritual lives. As we reflect on the great example that uh, Jesus gave us in going and dying for us on the cross and then going on into heaven to prepare a place for us, we know that he himself has not yet rested until we come. Uh, and we take the place um, that he, he has gone to prepare for us. So if Jesus is working, can't we join with him and do the good work of the gospel as well? If you haven't started your work with Jesus uh, and fighting these spiritual battles that we have to fight, uh, we'd invite you, you can come and join him in baptism uh, as we always do. But if you need the prayers of the church for restoration and encouragement or anything else, you can come forward for that also as we stand and sing.